pleasure to introduce our two presenters today. They completely obliterate the image anyone might have of university professors that work in ivory towers separated from the so-called real world. Uh, they have developed a, a really remarkable program that matches the resources and needs of local municipalities with the resources and needs of a university. And I'm reminded of the scene from the movie Dead Poets Society in which Robin Williams, as instructor, urges his students to seize the day and to make their lives extraordinary. Our two presenters have seized the day by redefining the university learning experience, and they've expanded the possibilities of what truly engaged faculty members can accomplish. And in doing so, they are changing America one city at a time, as we'll hear. In fact, some cities in two other continents as well. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce um, first Mark Schlossberg, PhD. He's a professor of planning and public policy and management and the co-director of the Sustainable Cities Initiative at the University of Oregon. He holds a PhD from the University of Michigan in urban planning with a certificate in transportation logistics, a master's degree in urban and regional planning from San Jose State University, and a degree in marketing from the University of Texas. His area of work focuses on redesigning communities for more active transportation, such as walking and biking, and using participatory mapping methods to catalyze community change. He teaches courses in sustainable transportation, bicycle transportation, city design, and GIS, and also teaches a summer bicycle transportation study abroad course in Denmark and the Netherlands. And in 2014, he released the book Rethinking Streets, an evidence-based guide to 25 complete street transformations to help communities and professionals repurpose their streets based on the evidence and experience of others. In 2009 and 10, Professor Schlossberg was awarded a Distinguished Fulbright Scholarship to the United Kingdom, where he focused on active travel to school issues. Prior to entering academia, Professor Schlossberg worked professionally in the nonprofit sector and served as a United States Peace Corps volunteer in Fiji. Our second presenter will be Nico Larco. He's an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Oregon and is a co-founder and co-director of the Sustainable Cities Initiative a nationally and internationally awarded multidisciplinary organization that focuses on sustainability issues as they relate to the built environment. Professor Larco holds a Master of Architecture and Master of City and Regional Planning and Urban Design from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Bachelor of Architecture and a Bachelor of Arts in Cognitive Psychology from Cornell University. His research focuses, his research focus, I'm sorry, is on sustainable urban design active transportation, street design, and how urban design affects the sustainability of buildings. Professor Larco was a 2012-13 Distinguished Fulbright Scholar in Spain and has received numerous national and international awards for his work. He has published in journals such as the Journal of Urban Design, the Journal of Urbanism, and the Journal of Architecture and Planning Research. His work has been the subject of articles in the New York Times, Forbes, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the Financial Times of London. He is a licensed architect and has worked professionally in the fields of architecture, urban design, planning, and development. And with that, it's my great pleasure again to turn the presentation over to our two guests. And Mark, why don't you go ahead and lead off? Great. Uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction. It's really great to be there. Great, great to be here. Uh, so this is Mark, and Nico and I are going to do a little bit of a tag team. So I'll start, Nico will come in, I'll come in again, and then Nico will take it from there. So basically what we want to talk about today is a new collaboration, a new model, a new framework to leverage and harness the power and resources of universities to work with communities in ways that advance everyone's agenda to help move cities forward and help move our students and our future workforce forward. So to begin with, I want to give a little context in the way we think about transportation. So hopefully there's a slide coming. Okay. So our idea of transportation is much larger than sometimes gets included in transportation discussions. So for us, we are thinking about big challenges that we urgently need to redirect our resources to help address. Climate change is an obvious one. Um, Obesity, health epidemic, we have a national uh, and actually international issue with a growing rate of obesity. 
of which our transportation sector can play a role in addressing, particularly in increasing the amount of physical activity or active transportation that we can use. Of course, our infrastructure is expensive to build and maintain, and we are seemingly in an endless, scarce financial situation, and it's hard to maintain and or build more expensive infrastructure. And we have a big change in our demographic preference. <clears throat> Active boomers uh, and millennials are demanding a different type of lifestyle, a different place that they want to live where they don't have to be dependent on a car for every trip that they make. They're getting driver Young people are getting driver's licenses at lower numbers, and our challenges in our city design and our transportation system is to meet this new market demand. So just as a reminder for everyone, I'm sure everyone on this webinar uh, has this broad perspective, but our perspective is that if we really want to address transportation issues, it takes a multidisciplinary approach. <clears throat> and to understand that multidisciplinary approach, we always have to be reminded that transportation is a derived demand. We don't travel because we want to. We travel because we want to try to get somewhere. And the main way that determines how we get from here to there is actually the land use system that we have. So integrating our land use and our transportation decision making is key. Of course, how we lay out the basic infrastructure and connectivity of that infrastructure is critically important uh, that to optimize certain ways of getting around versus others. The design and the quality of the actual sort of streetscape uh, is important as well. So here's two images of the same street. One is completely hostile to anyone other than driving a car. The other provides a lot of different options. So the details of how we create that urban environment is important for changing the modes or, or expanding choice for our population. And of course, what governs all of that is the policy. The, the pros and cons, the carrots and sticks, the incentives and disincentives all get started with the policies that we make, the local, state, regional, and federal level. And finally, the public's voice is critical. Uh, sometimes it's really critical to move forward, and sometimes it's important to understand where the public is and where leadership needs to happen to help move the public forward in ways that maybe the public can understand. So all of these domains we see as critical to moving our communities and our transportation systems forward. It's not just an engineering problem. It's not just a modeling problem. It's all of these domains. And so with that, that brings us to a model and a framework that we've created to help make this happen. I'll turn it over to Nico. Hello. Uh, great to be here, and thank you all for joining. Um, so as Mark was saying, uh, what, we, we have all these uh, uh, um, issues in cities. Uh, of the, the, there's a whole bunch of challenges. We have uh, um, budget challenges. We've got uh, kind of sticky problems that we can't get around. Uh, sometimes we have issues of bureaucracy that are kind of hard to, to have movement happen. Um, and then we have these things called universities, which are places where, uh, you know, part of our practice is to uh, – do research on cutting edge ideas to understand what best practices are around the country, around the world, uh, to try out new ideas, to think creatively. Uh, and we have this incredible base of students which are always coming up with new ideas and, and putting a whole lot of energy into this. Uh, and we thought, how, uh, what, what a great opportunity to leverage the work that happens in universities to help cities um, with the work that's happening, uh, with the problems that they've got, with the things that they're trying to to overcome and uh, succeed in. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for cities, on the one hand, if we could make this happen, because they're going to get all the benefits of, of working with the university. And it's a great opportunity for students, on the other hand, because they are going to be able to um, uh, take advantage of learning how the world works outside of academia, outside of the ivory tower, uh, and, and figure out how to be more effective agents of change. So the basic idea that we have, here we go. Uh, is what if we could connect existing university courses taught in their existing ways, things that already exist at the university, the, the, the regular courses, we're not adding new courses, to one city over an academic year to work on projects that the city has identified. So 
the in some ways this is very much like uh, service learning or experiential learning or, or community engagement that you see in campuses all over the country, all over the world. Uh, these are classes working with with a uh, with a community. The major difference is the scale of what we're doing. Instead of just having a kind of a one-off with one course, trying to find some person who who does this, and sometimes these these classes are extremely effective, and sometimes they kind of act more like philanthropy when they're one-offs, where where the cities um, kind of just says, oh, we'll help a student kind of a you know, class understand how things uh, how how a project might really work. In this case, we're pointing somewhere between 25 and 35 courses across the entire range of disciplines uh, in a university towards one city in one academic year. And that change, that difference in scale and scope changes everything. So uh, on the, the the there's a certain amount of buzz and attention that happens on the side of the city that we, we have uh, engagement by the mayor, the city council, the city manager, a number of different staff, obviously, who are, who are working with this. And it also changes the kind of energy and buzz that's happening at the university level, which, you know, the, the, all of administration knows about what this happening. We have, in, in one of our typical years, we'll have between 500 and 600 students who are working on this project. Uh, and so there's, that scale creates a certain opportunity for uh, attention across disciplines and across departments, both on the university and on the on the um on the city side, and really allows for uh, uh, impact and change. So what we what happens is we um, match up with what city we, we have an RFP process that uh, where cities apply and we select a city, and then we find courses uh, that uh, find projects that they are interested in that they are identifying things that they want to work on right now, uh, and are having either trouble getting traction on them or um, or having trouble with a. Uh, um, uh, just getting a, the, the manpower, the, the person power to make these products work as, you know, limited budgets and such. Um, and we, we identify these projects and then we find courses, match courses to these projects and they work classes back to back here. Now, what you see here, you know, this is labeled as transportation disciplines and that's exactly right. So, uh, as Mark was saying, you know, we, we strongly believe that transportation, uh, if we're going to deal with sustainability issues and we're going to deal with transportation sustainability issues, we can't work across any single discipline. This has to be a, a multidisciplinary approach to this. So uh, these are all the disciplines that we work with in a typical year, and you can see that some of them are more built environment and might uh, and might be more easily attached to transportation, but there's a whole range of other disciplines that are also working on these uh, projects. Can we be talking about the regulatory issues? Can we be talking about uh, um, uh, some of the outreach that might need to happen to put some of these transportation uh, practices into, uh, into practice themselves? Um, a whole range of different uh, pieces that, that, that plug into this. Um, and these are all, you know, these are, these are uh, um, disciplines that we have at the university, um, but there's, you know, every university has a different range of these, uh, of range of these um, projects and so, or disciplines, so there's a whole range of work that can happen depending on what exists at your own university. Uh, so in a typical year, we'll have something around 16 projects that the city has identified. That usually translates into something between 25 and 35 courses, because many projects will have more than one um, uh, uh, discipline or one, more than one course uh, attached to it. Uh, somewhere between 500 and 600 uh, students, which translates to about 80,000 hours of work. It's a tremendous amount of work that's happening, uh, just uh, person hours in, in this. Um, these are not since we, we cities are often very excited about that number, uh, these are not uh, necessarily consultant hours, but they are hours that, that, can, that can generate a whole lot of ideas and a whole lot of really fantastic product for them. Uh, we worked uh, in uh, 11, actually now 12 disciplines across two universities. We've also worked with PSU, which is about uh, two hours away from us, uh, and in uh, we're now actually in four different uh, uh, different uh, municipalities um, and seven different city departments. So it's really a, a huge kind of uh, uh, effort within this one single city. Um, uh, Nico, this is uh, Joel. I just wanted to mention to you and Mark, we're having some sort of scratching noises in the background, which could be something completely mechanical and technical, but just wanted to make sure there were no uh, uh, shuffling of papers or other kind of noises or writing with pencils at your end. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, sure. Uh, so the, the the other thing is that the cities that we work with have not been our home city. So you can see the star, uh, the the flagship of University of Oregon is in 
uh, in Eugene, Oregon. And we've worked with Gresham, which is the, the dot far to the north, um, which is a, um, a suburb of Portland. It's about two, a little over two hours away. We worked with Salem, which is the next dot down, which is the state capital, about an hour away. Uh, Springfield, which is a sister city to Eugene, so about 15 minutes away. And then uh, this last year, we worked with Medford, which is two and a half hours uh, south of us. Uh, and the, the, the furthest uh, city that we worked with, and yet also the largest uh, city that we've worked with, or the largest uh, number of projects that we've worked with. Uh, t- city size has ranged tremendously. So, you know, the 40,000, uh, a population of 40,000 up to about 180,000. And there's a whole a whole range in between that we've been working with. So it's all, all kinds of things that, that uh, we can work on with this. Uh, with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Mark to talk about some specifics on the project. Great. So it's really important to understand that one of the ways that this model is different than what a lot of universities do when working with communities is that we're not restricted to the city within which our university is, and we're working across a whole ton of this ton of disciplines. So I'm just going to go through a few of the typical projects. The projects themselves are not. Uh, important for the webinar today. Uh, what we're really trying to emphasize is that there's a different model to harness the resources of the universities and the needs of communities uh, to work together to solve problems and educate the next generation of our transportation workforce. So, but there's projects. <laughs> so here's uh, just an example of a class from a bicycle trans- transportation class that was really looking uh, with different cities on how to move forward with robust, modern era uh, bike infrastructure, transportation. So this was from our planning side, although a multidisciplinary class of students. And what the students are able to do is not only do the research out in the community, understand what the community needs are, but generate a whole lot of ideas and represent them visually. And when we're trying to move a community forward with a transportation system that's different than what they've had for the last 70 years, it's often really hard to visualize what that difference is. And students in the time that that they have in their classes can put together those types of uh, visualizations to help the public understand what different possibilities might be. We've done work on different uh, circulation studies, pulling in engineering students from Portland State University to be part of this, uh, looking at different areas from multiple disciplines, whether it's uh, urban design, law, planning, and uh, traffic engineering, all focused on the same area, really creates a robust understanding of the issues and a great opportunity for students to understand issues from multiple disciplines. In a GIS class, which isn't typically oriented toward transportation issues, why not have them do transportation work? So here is a project where a group of students essentially created an entirely new street base map for the city of Salem, but rather than using street center lines, they modeled every bicycle movement that would happen. So whether you took the lane, whether you rode in a bike lane, and how you made all your left hand and right hand turn movements, whether taking a lane or doing a Copenhagen left, which is a two-stage left hand turn, and really then being able to model the um, area of the city by a new thinking of how we understand bike transportation, which is this interested but concerned cyclist to the strong and fearless. So in this case, if you're unfamiliar with this topic, the image on the right here is how a city, how the city of Salem, Oregon looks if you are a strong and fearless cyclist, which pretty much means you'll go anywhere and you don't care. Uh, so it's quite an extensive bike route. If you're an interested but concerned, which is about 60% of the population that would bike if the infrastructure were more comfortable, the image on the left shows you what the bike network of Salem, Oregon is to, to you, which is there is no bike system. So this is what you can do with a, a new GIS modeled uh, class. Different students can work on modeling pedestrian environments. And again, this is a GIS example, but there could be an urban design, there can be a law, there can be a planning, there can be a public engagement, a whole wide range of things. Uh, we do a lot of urban design and urban redevelopment, which brings together architects, planners, lawyers, business, 
the geography, all kinds of different disciplines to help cities rethink those areas of town that seem to be stuck. You know, there's an industrial site that needs to be uh, thought in a different way, and that's just not going anywhere. Um, and there's all kinds of opportunities to move that forward, and it's really inertia and lack of creativity that is sometimes the barrier, which is a perfect opportunity for students and classes to take on. We've had some really interesting uh, talk, uh, projects. This was one of them. This was a combination of product design students and public administration students looking at street lights. And basically, the management of street lights in cities is generally a pain from what we hear, uh, financially, and then energy uh, efficiently. And so some public administration students took on the economics of managing the street light system. And then some product design students did a whole analysis of different street lights by different modes of transportation and models, uh, all different kinds of illumination and energy efficiency. Did a great job. And then they could create these renderings of what it might look like to install, in this case, uh, custom-made LED lighting in the shape of a leaf, because we're in Oregon, so we do things with trees all the time. And then these students actually modeled or rendered, you know, fabricated uh, an actual example of what the street light would look like. And so this is undergoing a pilot uh, in the city. Wayfinding. That's a big transportation issue and generally not something that we tackle in engineering courses. Uh, but this is critically important. How do you get to and through place? How do you communicate the different modes of transportation? This was from the city of Springfield, Oregon, where they realized through this project they had a lot of signs that helps people get out of the city, but didn't have very good signage to help direct people where to go inside the city. So the students actually went out and they geocoded every single street sign throughout the whole city and they created a whole database of what was on the sign, where it was pointing you to go, and what you should do to make it better. And then they created this whole district map for the city of Springfield. So this map is a student-generated idea, not a city-generated idea, which is to say, we should have districts in our city, and there's these unique hotspots that we can start pointing uh, people toward and use as uh, identifiers, economic development, etc. And then a group of product design students took all of that and started creating some schemes for what a new wayfinding system throughout the city would look like. So some kind of conceptual this way, and then some, uh, you know, photoshopping them in so people in the city could see what it might look like. We do a lot of work on redevelopment of big box sites. So these kind of big parking lots, sea of parking, uh, big box areas that maybe aren't doing so well anymore or are no longer in business at all, what can you do to repurpose these generally centrally located spots? So again, it's an opportunity to look at a whole wide range of possibilities that have land use, economic development, and transportation implications, especially when you're taking a big site that's mostly a sea of parking and are there ways to reintroduce a street grid to bring that area of land back into a, kind of an urban feeling rather than an isolated and only car-oriented and car-dominant spot? There is thin work through landscape architecture to relook at um, old industrial sites, um, to rebring them in um, to parkland to create um, uh, great paths and urban uses or recreational uses. So this is a site that was an old industrial site that's in the middle of a river. And there's a big plan to create a whole recreational network on how to reclaim uh, some uh, old industrial land into a robust urban park. Again, there's a transportation element when we think about bike pad paths and recreation uh, and so forth. So there's other disciplines that are involved that don't get sexy images as part of their disciplinary work, generally. So the law school has been engaged a lot. Uh, they've taken on projects like looking at system development charges in cities and what you can do with those. 
to generate uh, different outcomes than have been done in the past or help the city meet different types of transportation goals than they've been doing in the past. We've used um, classes on statistics, which and don't have to have any transportation element inherent in how they're taught. They're just hungry for a data set and a problem to solve. And we know that cities are data generators and don't have the, necessarily the time and capacity to answer all the questions they want. That's a fantastic opportunity to match. Journalism does a lot of community engagement work. This is what they do. They also can develop uh, histories of issues in a community. So for example, uh, how do, what is the public interested in in terms of funding new transit initiative, a new tra uh, a ballot measure, tell the history of transit in the, in the community, and understand and develop a way to develop a campaign that might lead to a ballot initiative. We've engaged the business school on a variety of different projects. One was uh, on industrial ecology, which is looking at the waste outputs of one industry as inputs into another. And in this case, uh, in, the, in the city of Salem, the work that the students came up with is generating or saving the city of Salem a million dollars a year since they put the student recommendations into practice and significantly reducing transportation usage because industrial waste had been transported from Salem to Portland, and now it's all being taken care of inside of Salem. So there's a significant amount of transportation or VNT reduction. We've engaged the economics department, and they will do cost benefit on anything. So they look at the land value impacts of bus rapid transit, the land value impacts of street improvements. There's all kinds of opportunities there. And geography. They love doing stuff with GIS. And so there's all kinds of transportation opportunities to engage different geography classes. And there's more, but I don't want to do everything. So we want to get into talking about like, all right, so what are the impacts of all this? Sounds all good, big scale, so what are the impacts? So I'll let Nico jump in here. And Nico, be sure to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? There yep. Okay. Uh, so there's all kinds of benefits uh, to uh, all, all kind of all, all areas of, uh, involved in this: so students, cities, faculty, universities. Um, for students, it's basically the, the, they have outside of just learning their content area, which they're learning, uh, they'd be learning in classes anyway. They're learning really how to be effective agents of change. So they're learning about how to how to take what they're learning in in the academic setting. How to make, how to apply that out in the real world, so that when they come out of academia and they and they start working as professionals, they can be effective immediately. Um, because we work across a number of disciplines, and a number of the projects that we work on actually have more than one class, more than one discipline working on that project. They start to learn how to work across disciplines, uh, how to learn the language of a different discipline, the 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 benefits and pitfalls of, of doing that. And so our hope is that when they come out of the university and they start working professionally, uh, they're working in a firm or, or at an agency, and they say, well, you know, have we talked to this and this discipline or that discipline? And someone kind of looks and says, you know, we don't usually do that. And their answer is, God, we were even doing that in school. Like, of course that's what we do. Uh, they often work in groups, which obviously is how a lot of work happens out, uh, out in the professional world, and that's a, a nice opportunity for them. They get to present in public early on. So typically when uh, students graduate from university and they go work at a, at a, at, in, in the public or private sector, it's probably a while before they get this direct interaction with uh, clients or direct interaction with the, with the public, and this is an opportunity for them to hone those skills early on. Uh, we have a number of uh, students. We hire the best one or two students from each class to hire to write professional reports uh, on uh, the, what's presented in the class, best practices, kind of lessons learned, and that's an excellent experience for them. They understand the politics that are needed to get through to make projects work. It's not just about good ideas, but it's putting good ideas into action, and a lot of that is understanding who who's at the table and what the politics of that. And there's a whole part of like workforce uh, and leadership uh, development. Uh, we have, as, as you know, as kind of we've been mentioning, well, through this program, what we have is a whole lot of students who didn't think that they that their work related to transportation. All of a sudden, understanding one what transportation was that it was a topic to be addressing, uh, the players involved, and that their work might actually benefit that, or that they might be interested in, in a career that works specifically in whatever their discipline is, but related to transportation. And we see that as a huge, huge benefit. Um, uh, in terms of benefits to 
to the cities, the, there's a tremendous amount of these as well. The, the biggest one that cities see first off when we when we go and talk to them is that you know 80,000, 60,000 hours, depending on the size of the, product, of the year, of work going towards that city. Uh, and that that obviously is a, a fantastic piece of this. The students do a whole lot of work. But as we as they go through the year, they start to uh, realize all these other great uh, benefits. One of them is just an access to um, a whole lot of new ideas. Uh, in, in, contrary to maybe how a consultant works, where you're trying to get into like one solution as quickly as possible to be responsible with your budget. Uh, and pedagogically in universities we have kind of a different stance where what we're trying to do is to talk about a range of ideas to really have students think broadly about this. And so in any given class we might have, you know, 15, 20 different approaches to the exact same problem. And so that actually lets, uh, and, and they're developed to a point where they can be evaluated uh, and scrutinized. And so that really uh, lets cities not try to quickly get to one thing, but to think broadly of what the possibilities are get stakeholders involved in this and figure out what the best possible solution is, which allows them actually to be uh, a little bit riskier in what they what they try out. Um, the, the, you know, the students, the university in general, we we are up, we're perceived as a politically neutral uh, in that we are not trying to get the next job. We're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. Uh, it's I mean, the, the the excitement from students is fairly contagious, and they really just want to make good work happen, and that is extremely disarming uh, to communities, uh, community members. And being very frank about what what um, what what the ideas are, what the reaction to the ideas are, without having to be uh, defensive about it. Um, as I mentioned before, because, it, we, because of this whole process, there can be riskier ideas, and, and cities, uh, city governments are, you know, sometimes risk-averse kind of entities. Uh, and, and having students be the ones who are trying a whole, one that we have since we have this range of projects and tuition for students, it allows these riskier ideas to be to be put out there. On the one hand, because it's just a range, and we, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. And on the other hand, because students, as I said, are disarming, and they let the the, the public is more open to listening to ideas from them. We also tell cities all the time that they're free to discredit the student work. Uh, we hope they don't do that with all the work, but that gives us the opportunity to try things that are a little bit outside of the box. And if it turns out that those are a little bit too far outside of the box, then you know, the city can say, oh, these are students, isn't this interesting, they're like trying things out. And if it turns out that there are things that are really, um, uh, really kind of capture the imagination, you know, the city can say, are we brilliant for having hired these students to try to, to come up with all these different ideas? Um, we expand the safe conversations I mentioned. There's a whole lot of opportunity for um, uh, for uh, community um, uh, engagement. So we have some classes that are really specifically uh, targeted at figuring out how to make community community engagement happen, which Mark talked about somewhat. Um, and then, but then in each individual class, there's typically uh, you know site visits, uh, meetings with the community, presentations to city council, presentations to community groups. This is a really great opportunity for the city to reach out to uh, its, its constituents on specific projects and also hard to reach constituents. Uh, there's a great opportunity for staff, staff training and, and uh, re-energizing. They, they, you know, sometimes the cities can be uh, kind of drudging bureaucracies. Um, but the 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 uh, ability to bring all these you know, twenty somethings with ideas, asking questions, uh, we've heard from a number of city managers that it's been fantastic in energizing their staff and getting to think outside of whatever boxes they've been thinking in before. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for connections across sectors. Uh, in one of one project we did in the city of Salem, in week two we had a site visit. Uh, with uh, three different classes, three from uh, four different classes, three from planning, one from urban design and architecture, uh, and on site were three department heads from that city looking at this area. Which one, they hadn't ever walked the site individually, and two, and they hadn't all three of them come together to talk about that. So that already was was creating kind of a, a connection and discussion which hadn't been able to happen beforehand. And lastly, there's a certain amount of buzz that happens in the city. We get. Um, a whole lot of press. Uh, we, we work on communications plans early on when we work for the city, but we get a whole lot of press. Uh, um, for instance, in Salem, the city I was just talking about, we had uh, 13 front page above the fold articles about the Sustainable Cities Initiative and the, and the work they were doing in Salem during the year. And that creates a certain amount of energy around and attention around these issues, which uh, are really beneficial. Um, for faculty, uh, uh, we have a Again, a whole, whole range of things. Uh, you get to develop a whole lot of new relationships with cities around the state, and you know we're now uh, entering our fifth year, I think, of doing this. And so faculty have connections 
all over the state, not a few that they might have had, you know, historically around areas that they'd already worked, but now they've got this whole network, um, which is, uh, which, which is, um, helps them when, in terms of research and in terms of, uh, finding new projects. Um, the students are, are very interested in this work and there's a lot of demand. We've, we've, um, we, we hear all, over and over from students. We do serve post and, and uh, pre and post surveys about their uh, um, expectations and experience with this. And they are very interested in figuring out how to apply the work they're doing out in the real world. And this really helps faculty meet that demand and, and uh, kind of build upon it. Um, for, this is an opt-in model. So this is the way this works at universities. It's not that all some, some of the, a provost or a dean comes down and says, this is what we're doing and you are all assigned to do this. These are individual faculty self-selecting saying, I want to be part of this project. And so there's, from in all the campuses that have done this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment, um, we've seen um, a tremendous amount of interest from across disciplines of people who wanted to do applied work that helps with their interest. And what what interesting thing that has happened now uh, a couple of years into the project is that the the introductions that have kind of been created through this, uh, you know, across disciplines within the universities, uh, professors getting to know each other, has led to conversations of what their research does, has led to actual partnerships uh, on research projects. So this is a great kind of uh, human capital building exercise within the university itself. Uh, as far as universities, the, well, you know, the, the buzzword these days seems to be doing things across disciplinaries. Uh, this is a great uh, uh, mechanism to make that ha happen, uh, a great kind of excuse to get people outside the specific work they're doing to start talking to each other and make those connections, that, which can turn into both uh, the educational and research side uh, uh, developments. Uh, it's supplied and relevant, which uh, universities at higher ed, I'm sure you all know, uh, and feel dearly that uh, we're kind of going through a crisis of, uh, of our value. There's a, a value being questioned. Uh, and this helps us very publicly be out there and showing how the universities are, are uh, a benefit um, um, to our communities. Uh, we have this real impact on communities, which is, is both extremely gratifying and also uh, um, uh, a great to, to be showing communities what we can do. Uh, where for the state universities, we, we like to say a lot, we, we're putting the public back in public universities. We are serving our state, and even for uh, universities that are not uh, public, for private universities, you still have the opportunity to, to have a statewide presence, uh, um, which is uh, good for visibility. Uh, and again, the student and faculty are interested in this type of work, and it's a great opportunity to make that happen. And this is all based on resources that already exist at the universities across the country. We're not, as we said, we, we don't create new courses. We're working on existing courses, some of them that might have been working with communities before, many of them who haven't. And we're just giving them a vehicle, making it easy for them to engage, and then directing that engagement, to, again, with the scope and scale that makes a tremendous difference. So as I said before, uh, there's often a lot of press uh, that happens. So um, there's a we, we've been in a lot of local papers. Uh, the, the This one, this quote here just shows, the, the cities, the, the work, because it's done on a, um, it's really uh, understood from the, uh, or, or come up with by the city itself, this is projects that they are really interested in and are, um, and are part of their work plan. So the work that's coming out of it are things that they are going to be using. Uh, the, we've gotten press in the, in the Times and, and in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Uh, and the, the basic idea is that they're, this is a model that is not only successful right now in Oregon, but it could be national and has become national in how we can create uh, community outreach and sustainability, how we can bring this to universities across uh, across the country. Right now, there are um, 17 programs across the, the country. About three years ago, we started doing trainings of individual campuses uh, and uh, of how they can um, learn to, to implement these types of programs. There's 17 across the country. Everything from large state universities to small liberal arts colleges uh, that are running this from, you know, some projects, some, some uh, programs have, you know, in the 20 or 30 projects going on. Some small schools have a, a small number of, you know, maybe like five or six projects that are going on. The scales related to uh, what their, what their, um, uh, what, what the, the size of the school and the size of the city. We've had awards, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, so how is it that uh, we can, create more of these types of programs, help universities that might be interested. 
On the one hand, we have a replication workshop, which is uh, we've, this, this is what we've been doing for the last few years, and the next one will be in April 2015. If you're interested, please uh, contact Mark right directly, and we can put you on the mailing list. Uh, this is where cities and universities uh, come together uh, and learn about the program. As I said before, 17 programs in 12 states uh, are already running this model. Uh, another thing we can do is we've got uh, both Mark and I and other uh, uh, programs that are already up and running uh, can help with actual uh, consulting and advising. So coming out to your university, going meeting with cities, uh, we, the, uh, these bits have kind of been used to catalyze uh, attention on the project, uh, on, this, on this idea to get faculty together, to get in front of the provost or the president, and they've been extremely effective, extremely effective in, in uh, getting the, the first uh, the startup uh, to happen. Um, and then the last thing is that there's we're developing a national network uh, of that uh, we just started uh, this last year. We have our first kind of directed meeting happening in November of universities that have these programs up and running. This is an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer learning between uh, different schools uh, to figure out how to how uh, how best to do this. Um, and uh, for resource sharing of uh, best practices and such. So with that, I will um, pass it back, and I think we are open to questions now. That's right. Uh, Mark, Nico, thank you very, very much for this description of this extraordinary program where you marshal resources that, uh, that are there, they're out there, they just haven't been tapped in this way before. Uh, as you say, the scale is really uh, what makes it so different, and I'm sure there's going to be questions about that. We have a number of questions that have come in, and the first one is, does the <clears throat> Sustainable Cities Initiative work with the Oregon Local Technical Assistance Program? Uh, this is Mark. I don't think we have to. I'm sorry, Mark, couldn't quite make that out. I don't think that we've worked with them directly. I'm trying to think if they were a partner from the city side, but I can't recall. I don't think okay. That's all right. Uh, next question is uh, stated this way. We're sold on the idea, but would like to know how the university staff and faculty were convinced to use university faculty and graduate student resources in this manner and away from their research projects. Did the city fund the time and resources used? So I can take that. This is Nico. Uh, so excellent question, excellent question. Uh, a couple different things. One is, and I think I forgot to mention, that um, when when cities, uh, uh, they apply for this, they, there's an RFP process. When they're selected, they end up part of the, the their, their congratulations of being selected. It's also, it comes with a, a price tag. And so um, we get somewhere between, um, uh, Two hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year from cities, and that sounds like a large number to to many cities, um, but it's actually broken up into a bunch of small projects that are usually between the 20, ten to thirty five forty thousand dollar range, and it's and it comes out of a number of sources: general fund, um, uh, the the um, urban renewal districts. Uh, there's a, a you know, school districts, parks districts, a whole range of different uh, private uh, developers that are contributing to this to make these work. And so that money actually uh, pays for the infrastructure, which is SCYP, the, the program, uh, to run. And so we have a, a full-time program manager. We, uh, we've got um, – this is how we pay for some of the reports and some of the transportation. But to answer the question in terms of the individual um, – uh, uh, the individual professors and, you know, taking time off of research, it's not doing that in the least because the only thing that we're doing is we're taking existing courses that a professor would be teaching anyway, and instead of them doing a hypothetical project or instead of them having come up with a project on their own or create connections on their own, we are handing them all that. So what we've heard from professors that, you know, we were professors to come back over and over and over again is that we're making their lives easier because the, the courses that they're teaching that they had to teach anyway all of a sudden, we're giving them all the resources they need. We're giving them a pro real product. We're giving them connections to the cities. And so and so that is actually a, a value add for them. Great. Okay. Thank you, Nico. And uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, that there will be a survey at the end of the uh, question and answer that we would like all of our uh, listeners to take just a couple of minutes to complete. It would help our presenters uh, understand how their message was conveyed and help them improve if any improvement is needed for any future presentations. So uh, let me go on to the next question. Describe one or two projects that were developed through your program and implemented by one of the cities. 
Uh, this is Mark. I, there's a, kind of a couple different responses to that, so the implementation. Because some projects take city time, <laughs> which is to say changing code, changing policy, changing transportation planning that goes through the committee and staff and city council and so forth. Um, but I can tell you about a project that I was directly involved in as a professor. So I teach a bicycle transportation class, and we were working with the city of Springfield, and they had some core corridors that they wanted help with. One was a busy street, uh, and they wanted something to do on that street or in parallel. One was on an off, um, uh, like a, uh, acquiring some forest land and do a trail and maybe do some development around that. One was connecting a new bike head bridge over the freeway that kind of just dropped you off into no man's land. Uh, and then there was another kind of neighborhood to school route. And my class had about 45 students of undergrads and graduates. Now we had 12 groups of four students each, and they took on these four different projects. The one that was primarily focused on this multi-use trail, bringing that into the city and using it as a catalyst, catalyst for new redevelopment uh, has sort of worked its way through, and recently the city has acquired that land, and they're working on developing that project. So that's sort of one example from all the cities that we've worked with. The response back from the city has been they have had enough real ideas and work to put into practice for six years. <laughs> they don't have to engage with us at all, and they have six years worth of work of real tangible things. And they will tell any other city manager that this is not charity work. This is not the city paying and engaging a university to be good philanthropists, but this is to get real ideas and real assistance to move real projects forward. Let me give two other quick examples just to give you a range of how what implementation means. So, for instance, uh, in in Salem, we did we worked on a, a formal industrial site, large industrial area, uh, area by the river. Uh, and we had three planning courses, uh, urban design course, uh, law course, and a civil engineering course, all looking at the area because the city wanted to see what could happen there. And there was a tremendous number of, of kind of ranges of what, how this, how that area could develop, uh, you know, kind of the regulatory issues, all of this. What was really interesting, so we talked about implementation, what was really interesting is that all of those courses individually said the biggest barrier here is there's a transportation infrastructure glut that's happening here, and we have two kind of major uh, 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 railway and a state highway. We need to figure out what to do with that. And that recommendation from all the different courses was sufficient to convince the city council that they needed to uh, fund a transportation study. So the implementation there, you know, as we all know how, how work happens in, in cities, was really to get the project unstuck, to get over that hurdle of we need to do the transportation study. So all that work really was valuable in doing that. Another example is um, the project that Mark showed, uh, the big box redevelopment, uh, large 11-acre site, I think, with uh, two former big box stores, um, that has actually, the, the students looked at a whole bunch of different options, of which all of them said, well, what if we added, you know, more streets here and made accessibility happen uh, and didn't have these seas of parking? And those those proposals have actually been used by the developer to uh, court uh, different potential um, uh, um, tenants. And that so that site is actually in the process uh, of, uh, of changing from this large kind of nameless uh, sea of parking to these, uh, this block structure with individual streets, so implementation in the works. Okay, great. Uh, you mentioned you've talked to a number of universities, gone around and explained the program. Uh, and a question here is, if anyone has said, no, we're not going to pursue it, uh, what are some of the reasons you get from universities regarding why they can't do this, and how do you address those issues? So, I'll think so and the main thing to get something going is to have the right catalyst inside of the university who has maybe permission, maybe not permission, but enough kind of smarts and energy to put this thing forward. And so for all the universities that we've talked with, some are uh, more quickly well positioned in that regard to move forward. Um, we haven't talked to anyone who has come around after our uh, training and said this is not a good idea for our institution. It's just a matter of taking the time to build the resources and the support. And so for those universities, 
where there's a champion but still lacking a little bit of the internal support, it's where when we make a site visit, we can really help them get over that hump. Mm -hmm. And do you have a list of the universities that are participating in the program? We don't have it publicly listed, but I can run through them. <laughs> so the University of Tennessee is launching right now, the University of Minnesota, the University of Iowa, San Diego State, Texas A&M, University of Texas, Earlham College in Indiana, uh, Penn State, did I say that? University of Connecticut, University of Maryland, the College of New Jersey, and there's a few others that I'm not thinking about. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, a question here is to uh, ask to describe the infrastructure needed on university campus to support this cross-disciplinary effort and the partnership with the city. I think you mentioned you have a manager, but as you say, the scale is large. It crosses all kinds of disciplines. How do you keep it organized? Who's the leader? Um, give us a little bit more of a sense of the detail. So there's, uh, we have, uh, this is Nico, we've got uh, one program manager, and that is really the most important piece of the infrastructure. They're the person who uh, is working on budgets, uh, um, making contracts go through, figuring out, um, uh, putting out fires if that needs to happen, making the connections between uh, the classes and the, um, and the city, the individual city projects. Uh, that is the largest piece of the infrastructure. There's also uh, the faculty, so Mark and I do a good amount of work in helping uh, um, kind of shepherd these projects along, uh, developing the relationships with the cities. We have a grants administrator who works on the on the um, budget side of this and, and on the accounting side of this. And they are, but they are, this is a small piece of much, much other, uh, much larger chunk of work that we do. Uh, and then we have, you know, the, the, as far as people who put work into this is the student workers, the, the, the people from, uh, students from the classes who are hired to write the individual reports and they're uh, paid for that. But the, really the, the main, the main, and I should say this is after, you know, five years of work that we've developed this, uh, in the first year and most, most programs in the first year have either a faculty person who's giving a little, given a little bit of time to run the program or because it doesn't always start this big, obviously. Um, or a half-time uh, program manager position, which is which is ideal to do something like that. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time. Again, I would like to remind our uh, people who are participating in the webinar to please take a, just, just a couple of minutes to uh, complete the survey. In the meantime, uh, for those who are, are would still like to have a, a little bit more information, there, there is a question about uh, what do you recommend as the first steps to get started? So, so, I, go ahead. so the first steps really, I think, is um, uh, I would say one we invite you to, to find out more uh, if you look at our website sci.uoregon.edu. Uh, there's a whole section on SCYP. You can take a look at uh, more information about the program. There's a couple articles actually, the New York Times and the Chronicle article, which are very good about explaining the program uh, uh, really succinctly. Uh, we have um, some information on uh, the RFPs, the, the RFPs that we've written and the actual proposal that we've gotten uh, back, as well as uh, a whole database on um, the different projects that have happened, so you get a sense of the range of projects that have happened in any given year or across the entire time and the kind of work that comes out of it. So I'd say first, familiar, familiarize yourself with that. Uh, the next step is starting to, um, uh, I, I, would, I would recommend that you reach out to us and we'd love to help uh, anyone who's interested in, in how to run this. Uh, and in fact, we we um, we have a, a, a UTC NITSI grant this year to, to specifically help uh, campuses that are that are interested. So we'd love to be hearing from uh, universities that want to put this into practice and help them. Uh, and the, then it's starting to build support within the university. And the support within the university is really just finding a couple of people who preferably across a couple of disciplines who are interested in, in pushing this forward, and then we can talk specifically about how uh, how to move that forward. Okay. Well, Mark, uh, Nico, congratulations again, and uh, very best of luck on growing the program. Hopefully uh, a lot of people have been listening in that would like to give this a try. They'll contact you and see if they can do it in their local communities. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone who has tuned in. And to uh, listen and uh, ask again to take a few moments to fill out that survey. And uh, we would welcome you back in two weeks when we'll have our, our next webinar here at Cutter. Thank you all for participating.